trials. The Lord, you accomplish what only you can do. Holy Spirit, we ask for your presence here today, God, that you give us enlightenment, God, that you would encourage us, teach us, challenge us, Father God, today. Let us not walk out of this place, God, having just gone through the motions of church. But Father God, let us walk out of this place being transformed, much like we're seeing yes. butterflies all around us today that have been transformed from a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly that is able to fly and explore. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to explore your creation in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I still never forget the day when um, the district called the church down in Purim, which we pastored Northwoods Assembly, and uh, said, uh, hey, you guys uh, did a great job with the Cowboy Church. You want to take the Walker Church and try to do the same thing, uh, revive it. I'm like, hey, why not? Let's give it a shot. It was a little further away than the Cowboy Church. We came up here, and I remember walking in the doors, and what a mess. I mean, garbage strewn all over the place. And you know, a lot of times in life, buildings that, like, things that are a mess physically is really, it's not even symbolic, it's reflective of a mess that was there. And I don't know what all here, I know this church had glory days, I know it had a you know, full sanctuary and all that kind of stuff, but many churches go through messes. As I've been having the opportunity to travel around to so many different churches, and not just here, but around the world, i found one thing. With not only churches, but ministries, is outwardly, oh, they have got beautiful websites, wonderful means for computers, <coughs> beautiful buildings. But when you have an opportunity to get inside, you begin to realize even the biggest of the churches have computer glitches. Amen. Have worship team frictions. Mm -hmm. Have congregational issues. Um, and, and I sit there in worship and I was just reflecting on as human beings, catch this, as human beings, we love to mask yes. something we don't want everybody to see mm -hmm. or know about. Amen. I catch this. Why do you think God does the opposite? We don't get to God mass heaven. We don't get to see the beauty of it. The perfection of it. Until we slip through that veil. Yeah. Amen. Yes. See, man is always hiding the blemishes, the age, the weight, whatever. God is only, he's not hiding anything but perfection. And there will be a day we'll enter into that. Amen. And we'll see that. Amen. We're going to give a little update because you guys have been so supportive. And I so appreciate um, you as a congregation are amazing to endure a porta potty <laughs> To endure a mess. And it takes special people that can see beyond a mess and make something beautiful. That's God. Amen. That's God working in every one of our lives. He sees beyond the mess because he's making a beautiful message out of it. And he's not through with any one of us yet. Remember that. We are all a work in progress. And you have been enduring the work of this building. And when, you, when I'm done, 3, 4, 5 o'clock, I don't know when, but when I'm done, that's kidding, that's kidding. <laughs> When I'm done, go check out the basement. It is phenomenal what is coming along because you're putting something together because God is putting something together that is going to far surpass the best days that this church has known in its history. Amen. I really believe that. Amen. You've got a phenomenal pastoral couple in Gary and Kristen. Amen. I, mean, I don't care where I am in the world, always on Sunday morning, it might be 9.30, it might be quarter to 10, but I always get a text message saying, praying for you, brother, praying you have a wonderful service today. And it's from Gary. He's one of the few. I would say, you know, Jesus had Peter, James, and John amidst, amidst the 12. And out of that, oh, Peter would like it to say that he was number one favorite, but it's not true. It was John. It was John that got to do a few. It was John that sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper. Peter was on the other side of the table. He didn't know what was 
what I would like to say, Gary is kind of like John. He's, he's right. He's one I can trust with anything and everything. And so I appreciate that. But in tune with masking things, this is a lot of what we get to see. I'm going to show a little video, which it, it, it kind of masks. It shows when you go through the city like this, it's all masked in, in beauty and lights and makeup and all kinds of stuff. But what's underneath, that's what God always sees. And that's what we need to try to get to see. So watch this, and then I'll come right back up. outwardly because there's a whole lot of stuff going on underneath. There's what we call the common expression, don't walk in somebody else's shoes because you don't know what they have been through in life. And this is what we are exposed to all the time. We call our ministry, you can bring up this slide, uh, changing numbers to, to names. And what does that actually mean, changing numbers to names? You see all those different numbers and all that. Well, the first time I went to Patty in Thailand to uh, um, work kind of undercover, um, I began to notice so many girls and even guys that wear numbers. And they were given numbers so that men could call them by their number and determine if they wanted to buy them for the next hour or two or overnight. Again, this city is roughly about 30,000 human beings are for sale in that city every single night. I've walked down the beach and coming to well over 300 standing there side by side shoulder to shoulder with purses and high heel shoes on waiting for somebody to buy them i've gone in brothels and sat where uh, in one brothel as many as 300 were working there that weekend um some there might only be a handful but everywhere you go somebody's for sale some have numbers some don't if you want to bring up the next slide here you can actually see a picture that somebody snapped um it's the next in that series there uh, inside of a brothel where they have a number board and all those numbers represent people that are working there that night and you can see one of the girls there that's a reflection in the re mirror reflection of the number board and so I've learned that when you want to go in and find out how many are working you know you don't have to sit there and count the bodies you just look at the number board and you see what numbers are working that night changing numbers to names you know what is their story what is it, is, is it all about as well as 
you know, statistics. And you hear stories of 30,000, you go, wow. But that's as far as it goes. You hear stories of 40 million that are trafficked every year, you go, wow, but that's as far as it goes. You hear the stats, every 30 seconds a child is sold into another predator, and you go, wow, but that's as far as it goes until it hits home. And so what we like to do is try to find, and one of my missions, one of my goals this next time we go over is I want to go through and I want to find out exact, I want to go beyond what I've been told and I want to walk in and record how many brothels there are on that street and how many are for sale in every one of those so I can give a true, because I do not ever want to be guilty of adding to or not telling the whole story. I want to be a person in a ministry of integrity. Amen. Changing numbers to names. So God's going to open our hearts today. But I just want to thank you. Bobby and I both wanted to thank you. Come on up here um, before I get into the message here. Thank you so much for investing in us, be it personally, monthly, or as a church, monthly. So we wanted to give just a short report of what God has done in our first mission over there. So you got to understand, missions is... It's a misuse term. Think about that. Missionary is what? A person on a mission. Much like a military. They will have operations so and so. And they go out to carry out that mission until it's accomplished. And so this first session, God really allowed us to uh, connect with many different ministries over there. Looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because once again, once we got involved with some ministries, it was like... You know, your website looks a lot better than what's really happening here. Yeah. And, but that's reality because you're human beings. Not judging their hearts. I think their hearts want to make a difference. But it's easy to get caught up. So one of the things Bobby has been doing is learning some Thai. We both have. But she's done a wonderful job. So she's going to greet you in Thai this morning and tell you what she said. On Parahat Sabari. That means Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, it's one of those languages that you hear him say something, you think, that meant that? <laughs> but no, to greet you it would be, Saudi ka, sabai mai ka, which is, hello and how are you? Um, it's, it's been a lot of fun learning, but it's also been a little frustrating because of that. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh, how do I remember? And like, the, one of the things that it's, it can trip you up is that, there are a lot of the same words that have many different meanings because they have a different tone. For example, the word ma, ma means to come. Like if I tell someone to come here, I would say ma. But if I see a dog, I would say ma. And if I see a horse, I would say ma. And if I see my mother, I would say ma. And so there's like, you have to be really careful. You don't want to call your mother a horse. So yeah, there's you, you have to learn tones and so that's that's been that's been kind of tricky. Um, so the other thing we want to do right is is uh, we have some things with us. Um, first I'll tell you, I'll explain that in a minute, but first what we would like to do is call Pastor Gary and Kristen up here. Is, is Kristen downstairs with kids or something? Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't need We're to. doing both of you. Oh yeah. We don't want to leave the children unattended. <laughs> These are some cards. Uh, they're just, it's just a little gift for you guys. And um, those are actually made by some women at a ministry called Tamar. You all know the story about Tamar in the Bible, so I won't, I won't go into that. If you don't, look it up. Um, it's for women who uh, they want to come out. Oh, there she is. Come on up, we have a little gift for you. Oh, oh. It's a homemade <laughs> card. Um, these gifts are made by women um, that have come out of this lifestyle that you're going to hear about a little bit today. And it, it's, they, they learn, they, they teach them different occupations, cutting hair, working at a bakery, and making cards, making different things, sewing different things, so that they can earn a living without selling their body. So these cards are actually made, now don't drop them on the floor when I say this, they're made from elephant dung. But I promise, it's been, I don't know what the process is, but it's not dirty and they don't smell at all. I promise. So they're really amazing. And um, I, brought, I brought one up here too as well. We, they are for sale on our table. Um, and, and there's all different. There's birthday. There's all different occasions. There's thank you cards. Um, 
they're they're absolutely beautiful and they have been made even though you might see the same card many times if you look closely it'll be just a little bit different because they've all literally been put together by hand by the hand of a woman who has gone from being a prostitute to a princess of the king and um, so yeah so these are, are for sale at our table and uh, we also have um, this is actually not for sale because it well it is but it, it's the only one we have but we just have it as a, as a as an example they actually take real Starbucks bags and make a little toiletries bag or a cosmetic bag out of it and they sell those and so um, I basically bring this with to show you I and mean, you can order it on their website um, but anybody goes through a lot of Starbucks coffee and you could save bags that I would be happy to take back to Thailand that'd be awesome okay um, one more thing um, we have a really good friend in Thailand her name is Tip and she is one of the girls who used to be a prostitute and now not only is a princess for the king but is serving him full time and is a translator she's learned English and uh, I won't go into too much details or stories in here but she she didn't even uh, go to school to learn English the Lord just sort of it was a gift and so she has written her testimony in a book called who I am and it's an incredible story. I knew a little bit of her story. I've never heard the entire thing, but when I started reading her book, I was like, oh my gosh, Tip, I have no idea. So this is an incredible book. We are selling these for her. They are $10, and all $10 we will be taking back the time to her personally. And same with the other things. Um, the things are for sale. The cards we have purchased, so as we sell them, we will be um, using the money to um, put on more of these um, Outreach the outreach dinners, and he may talk a little bit about that, but we do outreach dinners where we can have these girls come right out of the bars, we buy them, just like a man would for the night, we buy their time, and we bring them to a party, and we tell them about Jesus, and we tell them about opportunities like this, so, um, so just a little information about that, you can see me at the table afterwards. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's exciting to see what all God continues to show us to do. Uh, but I do want to share two testimonies with you before I get into the message today. Changing numbers to names. You know, one of the things I, I do periodically is I go inside uh, shadowing another person that might be uh, showing a, uh, another investigator around that kind of stuff. So I go in there to provide support. And as we mentioned, uh, girls that wear numbers. Well, it so happened here uh, last, just before we came back at uh, this this time. Uh, one of my partners that I've done work with, in fact, we just did an operation that took 21 months before they were finally able to execute and uh, do a raid and arrest the trafficker and free five boys. Uh, the youngest was 14, and we worked together the night before to set it all up so that the following day they could do the, the raid and the rescue. But uh, after that, uh, he had come back down and he was going to show a friend of theirs because he was moving back to the States. And so I said, would you like somebody to shadow? And he said, absolutely. So I went into the first place with him and sat on the other side and just kept an eye on him. Of course, he was watching me. And then I waited until they left and then he told me where he was going to go next. And so I proceeded to go up and go up this alley. And when he told me where he was going to go, I was like, you know, why do you want to go there? I've been there. I know it's, it's just, they, they do shows. It's not a, a good place. But he went inside, and so I went, and, and the girl out front was holding a sign, and basically her job was to get guys to come in and have a seat. And so I went in, and I sat down opposite of where my partner was, and as I sat there, she stood there looking at me, which usually means I can either say, you can go home, or, or you can go back to work, or let me buy you a drink. And I looked at her, and I thought, well, I'm going to buy you a drink. And she sat down, and as we began to converse, I looked at her, and I said, uh, so, and she knew very little English, but managed to communicate. I said, so where is your number? I said, all the other girls have numbers. Where's your number? And she said, oh, mister, I, I cannot afford my number. I said, well, how much is it? She said, it's uh, 100 baht, which is just shy of three hours. Her name is uh, Ta. And I said, well, Ta, I said, I'll tell you what. I'll buy you your number as long as I can buy Two of them. One for you and one for me, so that I can remember you. And I can akitan, which means pray for you. Which actually in Thai literally means make a wish. 
Now, if I stood up here and said, let's make a wish today, everybody, you'd look at me and you'd throw me out in the street. <laughs> but there are things that don't translate. Just like even in English, we think we have a corner of the Bible because of No, no, no. You have to understand Hebrew and Greece, right? So as uh, she looked, she said, okay, Mr. Okay. And I said, then the second thing is, you have to promise me that if somebody calls you over by your number, 404, you'll have to say, my number might be 404, but my name is Tom. She says, okay. Well, that night, the mama-san, the gal who sells them, wasn't there. So I said, I promise I will come back tomorrow night. And I did. Over there, when you make a promise, doesn't matter how old the girl is, they will always do a pinky promise. Mm -hmm. And so I came back the next night, I, I bought her number, and I sat there and I said, Tom, I said, can I ask you, I already knew a little bit of her story. She had, she's 26, she had a nine-year-old daughter. She has been down there in Padia for three years. She basically walked the streets selling herself to anybody that she would. And I heard some of those stories. She no longer wanted to do that, and that's why she was standing outside of the brothel just to bring customers in. And I said, Tom, we have an outreach. I didn't say that. I said, we have a party coming up. I said, would you be interested in going? She said, oh, mister. I said, it's okay. I'm not you know, interested in anything more than being like your daddy. She said, okay. And so she came to our first outreach party. And what it is, it's a beautiful party. It's free food, and we give away gifts. And there are people there that share their story, their testimony. They share the gospel, as well as the opportunities for them to leave and to start a new life. And so she came, and that night, after it was done, I told, I told her, I said, if it's done before you work, then you know, you're good to go. But if we run late, I will go down and I will pay your bar fine. And so I just want to show one little video that is dedicated to Tom. Now you have to understand, she likes to draw, and that's how she would communicate at times. At this point in time in her life, everything she had was in a backpack. And at night, she would go and sleep down in the concrete benches down by the water. And my wife and I were over there, and we heard this song come on the radio. It's not a Christian song, but we heard this song. We thought this could be a song written and dedicated to the life of every one of these that are here. But watch, and then you'll see what God did.
ago on a Saturday night, we got to pray with her Amen. at the table. Um, actually, we had another party and about 20, almost 20 girls that came, and almost all of them prayed to receive, Amen. Or asked for prayer. And uh, so the, her name is Ta. Keep Ta in your prayers. We were back there for two weeks, um, two weeks ago, and uh, looked her up, and she came to the party again. And she also came to church with us again. So that's uh, well over a month's worth of Sunday she's been coming to church. I wish I could sit up here and say, oh, she's received Christ and she's done all this kind of stuff. But she's still at that point of I respect all religions, which is Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But she signed to pass out Bibles. Because you know what? There are a lot of people who can do a lot of things for God. That's one thing. But finding out what God is doing and doing that is another thing. Mm -hmm. Labor Day week. 4,000 missionaries are descending on this city known as Sin City of the World. 4,000 with YWAM are coming. And they are going to have prayer boats. They are going to have prayer walks. They are going to be fixing homes. They are going to be handing out Bibles to the Chinese. And Ta signed up to hand out Bibles. So isn't that amazing what God is doing? Um, and I'll just share one more. If you want to put up the next picture. This is um, I think it's the next one on the slide. Yeah. There you go. This is uh, our little, little, we'll call her Nat, not our little girl. You know, everybody looks at her and goes, how old is she? Of course, you can't really see from that angle, but everybody says, oh, it must be 20, but she's actually 43. She was the girl who we weren't even looking in that direction. We were looking at the very obvious needs. She's actually the gal who drove us around and showed us properties for us to rent when we were over there. She was a devout Buddhist. She would hold the Buddhist amulet in her rearview mirror as she crossed over bumps so it wouldn't bounce. Every time she'd drive past an altar, she'd lie in front of that altar as respect. And we finally found a condominium that we were going to rent for six months, and she called on that Saturday night and said, can uh, we meet tomorrow morning to sign the papers? And I said, well, Matt, uh, we'll have to do it in the afternoon because we go to church in the morning. She goes, oh, well, can I go? Sure. We were going to, this was our second Sunday there. Our first Sunday we went to an American church that we planned on being a part of. But that Sunday we were going to a Thai church that I had spoken at. And we had seen the pastor that week. And we felt, oh, we should go and just attend his church. And so she came and we knew nothing. <laughs> but we were sitting between that and we were just praying for her. And when the service was over, she walked up to the altar. And I looked at my wife and I said, can it be this easy? <laughs> and afterwards, I went up to the pastor and said, well, what just happened? She received Christ. You mean, like, not like Christ and Buddha. No, no, no. She completely understood. After we got done, she took us in the car, took us up to what's known as Buddha Hill. And we walked all those steps all the way up to the top of Buddha, and she stood there and says, Nat no more needs Buddha. Right Amen. Uh, yeah, give the Lord praise. Uh, Lesson learned. Look at the margins. People are all around us. Your church is all, always, will always be one Sunday away from the impact, two Sundays away from having to find another facility. Think about that. If everybody that comes invites somebody, you're full the next week. And if every one of them invites somebody the following week, you're already looking for another day. Churches need to do more investing in that than all this other stuff. Right. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So she's still going to church. She's got Bibles. She's got all kinds of stuff. And when her grandmother was dying like a, two, three weeks ago, she had us live online as she was in the hospital with her grandmother passing away. She adopted us as her mommy and her daddy. Everywhere we go, she calls us mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. And so she watches out for us as we watch out for her. So thank you for enabling us to be able to go and to reach those who have never heard and that most would never want to put themselves in a position to try to reach them. But God's doing something. That's why he's, he's assembling the truths to go into the darkest of the darkest cities. So keep us in your prayers. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer as I share the message. You want to read the title of the message up there, Gary? It's simply called, How Much? How Much? It's 
It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do over there is to ask a human being how much. How much to buy you short time? How much to buy you long time? And when I took Ta down and I paid her fee, it was a thousand baht, it was thirty dollars, so she could be done with work at night. We walked out into the alley, and I'll never forget it. She stopped and she looked at me and she said these words, I'm free. I'm free. Father, today, as we just share for the next couple minutes this message, may it find encouragement into the lives of the people that are here today, God. May we walk away, God, being inspired. Lord, these have given so that we can go... The, the stories we just shared, it's their story as well. Because we are partners. In Jesus' name. Amen. She woke up like every other morning. Early in the morning, she could hear outside her window the women of the town chatting, laughing, walking to go and do what was their duty, their job for the day. But she knew she could not go because if she did, all the laughing and the cheering would be steered towards her. So she had to wait. She had to wait until all the other women in town were done with their job for the day. And she had to wait until it was the heat of the day. She lived in a very hot, dry place. And so she watched, and when the last woman was gone, then she grabbed her water pot, and she headed out to the well. Only one well in the entire village. But she headed to that well by herself, as was her custom every single day. And she began to fill her water pot. And out of the corner of her eye, she watched as a man approached her. See, nobody had approached her. She made sure that that did not happen. But he kept coming. And he came to that well. And he stood next to her. <coughs> Nervously, she was hoping that he would leave. But instead, he said, draw me some water. Her response was, why? a Jew here in Samaria. You see, Jesus went out of his way and broke every taboo. Well, you don't go and minister without somebody else being with you, but Jesus sent all of his disciples away to go buy food. There he was alone with a woman at the well. The story is in John chapter 4. And there they began to have a discussion. And in the midst of that discussion, they talked about living water. Woman, if you knew who was asking you of water, you would have asked him for living water. Confused, the conversation continued. Why are you here? Why are you bothering with me? And then the greatest of all questions. Go get your husband. Sir, I have no husband. You're right. You see, you've had five of them. And the man you're living with now is not even your husband. You see, in this story, Jesus takes a woman that has just become a number. She's had five husbands. In other words, we don't know if they all died or whatever, but chances are they failed. That's why she could not with dignity come out and get water with all the other women in town. With shame, she would go out alone in the heat of the day. And she probably was at a point where, you know, I don't care if I get married anymore. I'll just live with a guy. Because that is the story over and over as you walk through these streets. You see woman after woman after woman. And I've talked to so many of them. Number one, they hate, they despise, they will never marry a Thai man because they put him in the position they are now. They got him pregnant when they were young and they took off for another one. 
but they all are hoping on the same dream as they sit on their bar stools, as they look at the street, and they watch, waiting for what is known as a falon, which is a foreigner, to come and be their Prince Charming. And that's why it's nothing to walk through those streets and see a 70 or 80 year old man married to a beautiful, gorgeous 20 year old woman. Because their def definition of love is if you will take care of me, I will take care of you. It does not matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how much weight you have. It doesn't matter how much hair you have or don't have. I will love you. And they can make very good wives. As long as the money doesn't run out. Because to take care of me means you take care of me probably my baby, or two, and my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, everybody who's still alive, because if you are the oldest woman in a Thai family, it is your responsibility to take care of that family. Yes. That means getting a job, it means selling your body, or whatever, you do that, because that's honorable. And that's how the people who traffic them take advantage of their religion, because it basically is built on merit. If I do enough good, I'll be okay with God. And this is why every morning, and I get up every morning really early, and I walk the streets, and I pray through the streets, you see the Buddhist monks walking around. And whoever would be willing to give them money or give them food, they will stop and pray a blessing of prayer over them. But those who won't, they'll just keep on walking. That's called merit. And they know where to walk. They'll walk down that street at 6 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning. Because they know there's a whole bunch of people that are drunk, don't know what they're doing, or they're guilty because of what happened the night before. And they just want to do some good. So they're good to go with God. Now, we laugh at that as Christians, but, you know, a lot of Christians are guilty of the same thing. Right. I just got to do more. I got to sing more. I got to pray more. I got to give more. I got to. I got to do something more. No. Value. How much? How much? Jesus. And, and this is this is my three quick points here. I'm going to give you two basic scriptures. Go to go to the first scripture there. I, I love these. Matthew 10:29 to 31. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I wish you could bring that down. Can't do it, can you? No, sir. But it says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? You see, people would come to give their offerings to God. And if you were really, really poor, you weren't let off the hook. You had to give an offering. And so a sparrow was as cheap as you could get. Two sparrows for one penny, one coin. And they would present their offering to God. But Jesus told the disciples, not one of those sparrows can fall to the ground outside of my father's care. They might not have any value in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God, even a sparrow has tremendous value. Go to the next slide, because we all like a bargain, don't we? Have you ever gone to the store and gone shopping? This one's got buy four, get one free. How many of you go grocery shopping? You like you know two watermelons for the price of one, or you know whatever it is, or five for four, whatever. In fact, I'm going to give you a deal today. If you want to buy these cards, normally they're five dollars each. We'll do three for ten. Okay. And believe me, that's the last thing I want to do is like sell money or whatever. This is really to support these guys. But believe it or not, the whole sparrow story. Go to the next slide. I, I love this because it's even here in the Bible. In Luke, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more 
than many sparrows. You see, and I bring this up because I'm talking about, and, and you can't fathom unless you've been there, of wearing a number and somebody calling you by your number, number 88. Her name was Tang Mo. She uh, basically asked for a prayer the night I sat with her because the next day she was going on a job interview and uh, evidently she must have got the job because she was no longer there and she gave me her number. So praise God for that. But as human beings, I think we all have felt like nothing but a number at times. Now, even churches are getting really good in the battle to try to connect with people, they have actually grown further and disconnected with people. Because in the run to be numbers game, and I know as a pastor for so many years, one of the first things when you talk to somebody, another pastor is, oh, what are you pastor? Oh, how many people you got going? That's what it boiled down to is you're successful or not successful based on how many people you got coming to your church. And it becomes a game amongst pastors almost. It, it almost becomes an embarrassment sometimes because you want to avoid that question if you didn't pastor a church that had hundreds or grew to be a, a, a mega church. And in the midst of the mega church movement, there's some good things about it, but there's also some bad things. People like to be known as more than a number. Yeah. And there are programs today that you can put everybody's name on a list and it'll spit out a card that will look like your handwriting. But it's not. It's a computer generated code of your handwriting. So it looked like it came from Pastor So and so. But it didn't. How do I know that? Because I bought into that. Because one thing I've learned is. One-on-one -on -one time with people. The greatest sermon analogy that came out, in my estimation, was the iPhone 10. iPhone 10. I could give you my give you an iPhone 10 and, and say, go ahead, look at it, look at it, and it won't open up to you. But if it's my iPhone 10 and I look at it, it'll open up, and everything that's in there will become accessible to me. And that's the key to effective ministry. Is if you are face to face with people long enough, they will begin to open up to you and let you into their heart. Let you into their hurts. This is what Jesus is talking about with these sparrows. Is You are of more value than all those sparrows. There's so many little sparrows. I don't know if they're sparrows or not over in Thailand, but God always seems to drop them in front of me and I see them walking around as I'm on my prayer walks. And one thing that keeps coming to my mind every time I see it is simply, I take care of you. I take care of you. Which is ironic because that's what every woman in those bars will say to you is, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you for one hour, two hour, weekend, whatever. I'll take care of you. But God says, I'll take care of you. You see that the little bird. Not one of them is going to fall and die without the Father knowing it. Now, three P's I'm going to give you. Number one, priceless. You are priceless Amen. to God. You see, nobody else could pay the price. Now, I could go on these streets and I could buy a girl, you know, for the night for $30. And I can do anything I want with her. And she'll have to do anything I tell her to do. As long as we put that all in, the, in, in writing, so to speak. Not in writing, but we agree to that term. Gotta pay the price. And night after night, men pay the price. But guess what? So does a woman. I remember number 132. Her name, cartoon. Older woman, I sat next to her. And when she made this statement, I fought back tears in that problem. I said, is it busy tonight? And so all she looked at me and said was, many customers are good for the money, but not good for the heart. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow. wow. Why would you say that to a guy sitting next to you? Except for the fact that God shows me the people to sit next to you. Priceless. 
See, the only price, and there is a price for you, but the only way it could be paid was by the blood of Jesus on the cross. And that's why God himself looked down and said, there is a price to be paid, and I am the only one that can pay it, and I will pay it. Aren't you glad God didn't send an email or a text message and tell you how much he loves you, how much he misses you? No, he came himself. He put on human form, human flesh. He walked among us. He suffered among us. He was tempted like we're tempted. He went to the cross. He was beaten, ridiculed, mocked, crucified. But on the third day, came back to life again. Amen. He paid the price because you are priceless. Amen. Number two, you are precious. Red, yellow, black, and white. We are all precious. You are precious. You have value to God. The devil does everything he can to beat us down thinking that we are worthless human beings. And that might happen through broken relationships, failed businesses, that we're worthless, we didn't do right, we didn't do good. And watch what, listen to what comes out of your own mouth. And you will quickly agree. There's somebody behind me wanting to say that I'm just bad, worthless. That's the devil. God says you are priceless and you are precious. What does precious mean? Precious gems. See, everybody prides themselves on trying to get owning something that nobody else has. Now, my name is Dirk Curry. Nobody in the world has that name. I can guarantee you that. I have gone online, typed my name in, YouTube my name. You know, a lot of you, I can put in your name and there'll be five or six of you or more. There's only one there. But I think we all want to have that one painting that nobody else has. That one vehicle that nobody else has. It's called being precious, it's called being set apart. Now, I want you to catch this today. There is not another you in the entire world. Even a twin, triplet, or quadruplet. They might look the same, but there's, you get close enough, there's some differences. Maybe a little height difference, maybe a little color hair difference, maybe a mole here, or whatever it is. God never made two people out of the billions and billions of people on this earth. You'll never find another you. You might find a resemblance but it's not you. You're precious. In his sight, you're one of a kind. And God has gifted you with gifts that he only wanted you to use with people that only you can get into their hearts. That's the only reason I can say God sent us over here. I don't know the language. I don't know the people. I don't know the culture. We went over there completely by faith. We got off the plane and we didn't even have a ministry show up to say, hey, welcome, come, let me show you around. We got off the plane, we got on a taxi, we went and stayed in a hotel that we had rented for seven days, hoping, trusting, believing that at the end of seven days we'd have a place to live. Not only did we have a place to live, we already had a soul for the kingdom of heaven. By faith. By faith. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that you can do to please God. See, because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And honestly, I share this in all the churches we speak at. You know, why would God call us away from a church that had three churches and all three of them debt-free and money in the bank and all that kind of stuff and your, your kids are having your grandkids now and your family lives in the area. I mean, th this would be a pastor's dream. I would say it's God's more concerned about my personal faith than my ministry. Mm -hmm. Become so comfortable that you don't even need to see a paycheck. It's just automatically positive. You're not living by faith anymore. It's time to be stretched. And boy, has God stretched us. <laughs> and he's not done yet. So you are priceless. You are precious. And the last one. You are. If you get those first two, the third one, I pray to God you get the third one. You are powerful. Amen. Not you, 
But the Bible says the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's power. I mean, when Jesus rose from the dead, there were some other dead people in town that came back to life again. That's power. That's resurrection. It's dynamite. It's where we get the word dynamite from the Greek word dunamis. We get dynamite. There's power inside of us. And when you can get to that point, the devil has beat you up. He beats me up all the time. You're a failure. You didn't make it. This didn't make it. Whatever. We fight through that. And the devil does that because if you can get the revelation truth, you are priceless. You're priceless. Every time you see a bird, a little bird, I pray to God right here, right now, that those words come into your mind. I'm taking care of you. I know and I feed that bird. I will feed you and I will care for you and I'll care for your children. I'll care for your grandchildren. You don't have to strive to be different. You already are. We're a peculiar people. We're one of a kind. And lastly, you have got power yeah. to pray for. That's what the Bible says. Pray for one another. That's right. That's what the Bible says. Reach out in faith and pray. For you don't know what to do. Just simply go up to somebody and say, how can I pray for you? Pray and watch what God does. Our youngest son is entering his second year of an internship at Chi Alpha, which is college campus ministry. He is, I would say God has already done through him more miracles of praying for people than he has in our 30 plus years of ministry. His first one was a, at, a, at a conference, at the conference that God really got a hold of his heart. And he watched a whole bunch of people praying for somebody and went up and said, what are you guys praying for? He said, well, this girl here, she has been blind in one eye from birth. Can I pray? That's all. And he prayed. And the eye opened up. And they started hollering and jumping and screaming and shouting. What's going on? She hadn't been able to see since she was, not even when she was born. She could not see. He just came back from a missions trip in Alaska where a kid came up and confided and said, um, I want to go home. I'm homesick. He said, okay. So at the end of the service, he came up and the boy said, you know, I'm not homesick anymore. That really touched me. And I would like prayer because I've, I've always been colorblind. I can't see color. And they prayed, you know, I guess what happened? First time in his life he's seen color. Mm -hmm. See, I wish I could have more time to share more stories, but let me end it with these two thoughts. One, again, over and over. You are precious, priceless, and powerful. Amen. Never forget the neighbor next to you is just as priceless, Amen. just as precious, and has just as much power. The devil gets us gnawing at each other. Neither one can rise to the position that God made us to be. The head, not the tail. Never walk away from a need. Never walk away from what God is calling you to do. When we left, to come back here in April. Nat, she was going to take us to the airport. And business came up and decided not to. But the night before we left, she came to our condo. I actually have video of it. She came to our condo and she just looked around. And she saw the luggage that was packed. She saw the clothes that were out of the closet. She saw everything ready to go. And all of a sudden, she just started bawling. She said, Mommy, Daddy, please don't go. Please don't go. 
The next day we made it to the airport and as we're sitting waiting to board a plane, she sent a video. She had gone back to our condo. And she recorded the empty condo. And she turned it on her. The tears streaming down for two or three minutes. We couldn't hear. We just watched. So I want you to watch this last video. And then I want to pray with you. But before you watch it, thank you for allowing us to go. Thank you that we always have a place to come and share here at Walker. And let the words of this song, as you will see, actual people that we have sat with during the last mission. And that we look forward to, to going back and sitting again. It's an incredible sight we walk up and down these streets at night. And Bobby, one of the things she does is she'll help teach English to a lot of these black girls. And I'll never forget walking out the street. And you, you, you can't fathom it, but what's on the street is what's inside of gentlemen's clubs around here. I mean, there's poles and girls and all this. And I watched as a girl with a fishnet standing at a pole, leaves the pole, leaves her customer, and runs out of the street and gives her a big hug. Because she remembered her from English class. Bobby didn't recognize her because she didn't show up to English class looking like that. <laughs> but watch this video and let it minister to your heart.